Good morning, Grid Connections listeners. Today, we're diving into the world of outdoor adventures and electric vehicles with a very special guest, Brian Clark. He's the CEO and co-founder of Ranger EV. Brian takes us through his journey from a career in neuroscience to founding a company focused on solving a critical gap in the EV charging space, making energy transactions when charging EVs as seamless as Venmo. In this episode, we explore how Ranger EV has transformed the way outdoor enthusiasts like Brian and his community electrify their travel adventures and just generally make level two charging for EVs stress-free. Whether you've ever felt a bit of range anxiety, found yourself searching for a place to charge in a remote location, or simply want to hear more about the future of peer-to-peer EV charging, this episode is packed with insights you won't want to miss. Before we get started, if you enjoy what you hear, we encourage you to share this episode with at least one friend who you think would appreciate it. Don't forget to leave a review on our podcast page. It helps us reach more listeners like you. With that, enjoy. Uh, for anyone that might not be familiar with yourself or specifically what Ranger EV is doing, uh, could you just share us uh, share with us kind of a quick little overview about the product and kind of what got you into the space? Sure. Um, maybe I'll just start a little bit about what got me into the space. Um, so I'm a lifelong outdoor enthusiast. I grew up in Minnesota hunting, fishing, camping, um, And then during my college years, I was more into rock climbing and alpine climbing. Um, I had um, some friends who moved out here to the Pacific Northwest, and we got more interested in surfing. So now here in Oregon, I like to go out to the Oregon coast with them and uh, do my best to surf with them. And uh, my background is in neuroscience and neuroimaging. So I was a neuroscientist, and then uh, I worked as a neuroradiologist. And I got into the space because I sort of, um, as a neuroradiologist practicing here in Portland, I started to get more interested in climate and electrification. Um, I got an electric vehicle for myself in 2019. And very quickly, all the types of fun outdoor stuff that we like to do in the region, I started to see the problems um, that were arising that would hold up sort of uh, adoption, which I think is this great technology and this electrification push. Um, So that got me excited to uh, build something of my own. And I I saw this big opportunity to try to electrify the travel adventures that me and my friends were taking. Um, And that's that's what got got us into it. And uh, Ranger, Ranger EV, so we're new. It's, um, we're building a software platform to do peer-to-peer EV charging, or as we call it, it's this new category of um, transaction, which is energy transactions. So um, when I did, so for my first vehicle was a Tesla Model 3, and uh, I'm one of the people who got excited when Rivian was starting to show what their vehicles would be like. And I was got an early electric pickup truck. Um, and for me to visit my family and do all the things I wanted to do, I was finding I had to plug in in all these weird places, um, like having to sleep under the stars and plug in at an RV park, uh, which is cool and beautiful in rural Idaho. Um, mm-hmm but it often led to somewhat like awkward conversations with the business owner about what I owe them for the energy to charge up the Rivian. Uh, So that was sort of the genesis of this product was like, uh, we we call it a a Venmo for private EV chargers or a Venmo for energy transactions. And we're really interested in making these peer to peer energy transactions seamless with software. And I think that's such a great thing because there is still uh, I, I talk with people about this quite a bit, especially here in the Northwest. Uh, I I think there's the corridors, I-5, even like Highway 97 going kind of through the middle of the state. There's decent now, even 97 really just from the last year, but uh, decent high DC fast charging uh, availability. Mm-hmm. But you really don't have to go too far off the grid and I think like when you look at it on paper, like, well, if you're just going straight there and straight back, you should have enough charge. But in like reality, just with people's lives, you might go on a little bit of a detour, especially when you're out in nature and go go on a different hike. And the 
more chargers of any type, I am just a big fan of because it, it is surprising how often I shouldn't say I'm feeling like range anxiety per se, but it's like, well, you know, if there was a charger right here, this would just have made my whole experience as an EV driver either a lot simpler or just kind of, um, I don't want to say stress inducing and maybe it's because I've been doing it for so long. It doesn't really give me stress anymore, but just like it removes a lot of that like logistical layer. And I think one of my favorite yeah. things about an EV is just the fact that you can charge it when it's not stationary, as opposed to like having to take a combustion vehicle all the time to the gas station to really get gas. But um, so one, yes, I think that's great. But two, I am just generally curious and maybe you have a secret spot, but you mentioned surfing on the Oregon coast. Can you share where or what, at least if you can't say the area, what, what part of the coast that you usually go for surfing? So because of its proximity to Portland, uh, yeah. usually we're on the, on the North coast. So, okay. um, you know, where you're popping out on 26 or six is okay, usually, that's... um, where I'm meeting, where I'm meeting friends. Yep. That's, um, that's what I kind of figured. And I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, um, so what, what sort of vehicle do you drive? Where, where do you like to go on the, on the weekend? Yeah, so our daily is a Tesla Model Y, and mm -hmm. we've had it for just over two years now. We've put them out 60,000 miles on it. Mm. Um, so for me personally, we, I would love to see it with more ground clearance and make it. It doesn't need to be like an off-roader. Our actual other vehicle is a 1987 Land Rover Defender 90. So oh, nice. That's like, and, and to be honest, that's what I kind of like about the Rivians. I think they're really cool, and they, the, the comparisons between the two, like, platforms and products i see a lot of overlap um but yeah i mean for road tripping i mean we only now put about i think the past year we put maybe four thousand miles on the defender it's a great like mm -hmm. weekend vehicle especially when we're in bend or hood river we'll take it up to the mountain kind of go around there but we put so many more miles and like do a lot of our road tripping in the northwest on the model y and overall it has been great i mean that is kind of where efficiency is key when you're going to some of these yep. more remote places. Um, and there's so many more state parks that I'd love to see level two charging offered at. You don't need some big installation, but uh, just even having a stop here and there, I think just brings down the uh, challenge. I, I, it's not even challenges anymore, but it, it just, like I said, it's just such a nice thing to have as an option uh, to be able to charge somewhere when you're out on a venture and you don't have to even think about or worry about it. But yeah, I mean, I, this is the this is the big point, and yeah. this is the big, um, I think, the, the informative part that all my peers and friends who don't have EVs, or as we encounter a lot here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, two vehicle families, just like yeah. you described, where they're hold they they love their EV, but they're holding on to their second ICE vehicle just for that reason, because the sort of weekend adventures or weekend warriors there's just more friction or a barrier because there's this added. So what we call it now is range anxiety. We don't think is a big issue anymore for the reasons you listed, because along the major transportation corridors, DC fast charging gets better and better. Yeah. Um, we call it charging anxiety now. And it's that, and charging anxiety is different because this is what I encounter on the North coast of Oregon, which is sort of a charging desert. Yeah. Um, I'll end There's up not right. Fast chargers either, actually. There's a yeah, couple like in seaside, and then it's kind of south along the exactly. Coast. And um, there's now some Tesla superchargers uh, by the Tillamook Creamery in yeah, uh, yeah. Tillamook. But if you're right in between those, I mean, we're starting to do this accounting of all our trips, which is the time and money you would save if wherever you're staying overnight, you could plug in your vehicle, and that's yeah. that's really our focus. Um, you know, in Norway, where they have EV adoption um, much further along than us, level two charging is sort of ubiquitous. So right. wherever you're staying overnight away from your home, there's usually a level two charger available. And I think that's the, that's the vision we want to be a part of. Uh, what makes us unique is where we're trying to deploy that. We, we call, if you join our platform, if you're a destination, um, we call, we call your location, a ranger station, and we plan to have a lot of fun with that in the future. So we're always interested in hearing where people want to be going with their EVs and particularly where they're staying overnight when they're away from home, because as you know, that's the best part about the EV is like, yeah. you can charge it while you sleep. 
And that's what makes the big difference for me when I'm meeting friends uh, to surf on the North Coast is, I mean, time is precious to all of us. And we, we did the accounting on the last trip. So we would have saved over an hour in time because we had to drive a little out of our way to go to the fast charger. And yeah. it was almost, you know, Rivian is a big battery pack. Then it was almost 40 minutes at the fast charger. And we did the math. If my friend's house that I stayed at, if we got him a level two charger and he joined the Ranger network, um, you know, I could have saved close to 17 bucks compared to those DC fast charger prices. And uh, my buddy could have even pocketed 20 bucks, you know, if he was going to sell right. me the energy. No, I, and I, I think that's what was so intriguing, kind of learning more about the technology, because uh, you're totally right. I, I think in a lot of ways, DC fast charging isn't actually super uh, convenient, depending on like the use case. And like, especially when you're kind of going to a more remote area, it's it's more um, kind of an aviation about it. I guess it's maybe closer to two decades ago, but it definitely at least a decade ago, you kind of saw the change between the spoke and hub model and kind of the flying point to point having these planes that are in the commercial space specifically, where instead of having a bunch of jumbo jets and you would fly from like PDX down to LAX and then fly to the UK, you started seeing kind of this smarter optimization of just like yep. flying point to point. So going from like PDX to Heathrow. And I think that in some ways that's almost how you have to kind of think of level two charging, like the DC fast charging. I mean, um, I don't know, like, a trip I've done actually quite a bit and it is kind of a pain in the butt uh, in some ways is uh, I've gone from Bend, Oregon to Phoenix, Arizona a few times in a day. And it's a very long day. It's about almost 1200 miles and it's a decent amount of charging and it's definitely gone better as far as like the locations and stuff like that. But I realize when I do that trip, I am a small few, uh, like not even an EV, very few car drivers even drive that far or that mm -hmm. much in a day. And so I think just kind of getting better technology and making it much easier for people to leverage level two charging. Uh, obviously you start getting into the multifamily stuff too, and just like where it makes it a lot easier for people to have uh, cars if they don't own their own home, but especially just going on like a weekend little trip, like having something where one, you just um, it is on the North coast Oregon. It is kind of rare to find DC fast charging. Most of them, um, there's the Tesla one in seaside, but that's an old V2 one. And then, uh, my wife and I have been going to Astoria a lot more. And I think the only thing they have there, like maybe tops out at 50 kilowatts. Mm. And so it's like, if the thing's working, you got to park it there and leave it there for a while. And then there, especially like the peak of summer, there's other people trying to use it. And more that's often than not. Key. That's yeah. the key point too about DC fast charging. Yeah. So uh, as EV adoption um, ticks along, that's what you encounter if you go to a lot of places in California is queues right. at the DC fast charger too, depending on time of day. So that's, um, yeah, that's the big situation, which is use them when you need them. As you know, um, from a traveler's perspective, when you're on the road trip and you just want to stop for 20, 20 25 minutes. Um, but in a lot of cases, you'll save time and money and not have to wait in line if you could have had it plugged in overnight. Oh, yep. oh totally. And I, I think, honestly, it just creates such a better experience for one thing. You don't even have to even think about it. You just plug it in when you get there. And admittedly, we've been able to do pretty decently for the most part on a lot of these trips just using a level one charger or like just a regular well outlet if we need to. But it's obviously <laughs> far from ideal. <laughs> And well, that's what's nice about the um, having a super efficient vehicle. And I think yes, it's one exactly. thing um, we've encountered uh, the RV park use case, for instance, is yeah. as the electric vehicles get bigger with bigger battery packs there. So the, the Rivians of the world and the other large um, SUVs, they're bigger battery packs. And remember, they're like half as efficient as like a Tesla right. Model 3. So um, they take they take a little bit longer to charge, and there's more energy there. So for the sort of adventure capable electric vehicles that are coming to market, um, yeah, level one charging is super challenging. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great point. Too. It's, it's about it's about like one mile per hour. I think is right. what I was getting with my R one T. Yep. Yeah, I mean with uh, R Y even, which is pretty efficient. It's like one to 2% an hour, which isn't bad. 
Mm-hmm. But um, even our situation where you want to drive up and down the coast each day to go to some adventure and something can be kind of challenging. And I, I'm a big fan of the Rivians, but that was one of the big hindrances. Like when I was just logistically trying to figure out like if it made sense for us and with like how far we like to drive. And I think as a car overall, it's great. It was just kind of the charging, unfortunately, because of the size, the inefficiency, and then also like the DC fast charging uh, performance was I think when it came out acceptable, <laughs> um, but like compared to others, when you're trying to cover a lot of mileage, it just didn't really fit with our lifestyle, but it is, you're totally right. There's so many more, uh, it's well to me, like just since the R1T came onto the market, how many more electric SUVs there are mm-hmm. now as options. And clearly that's just what most American families are looking to buy or would make the most sense for them. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think that's something you have to be kind of proactively think about because that is where the future. And I think most likely a lot of people are going to be served by going uh, to EVs. And so I'm kind of curious, I've had some interesting experiences when I've not really bad, but going to RV camps to charge, there definitely seems to be more of a, it used to be, you could just kind of plug it in and I would notice sometimes would throw a breaker. Yes. And I, I think you can do this in the Rivian. I know you can't do it in every vehicle, but then you can bring down the amperage that it's pulling when it charges. So then you don't have to kind of worry about throwing a breaker. So it's not doing the peak performance, but whatever, it's great. However, it does seem like more campsites have become kind of, uh, they kind of push back on electric vehicles or some won't even yep. allow electric vehicles to charge anymore because of that. Because of those that pesky EV bandits. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that, who and just, the, like, who just turns want around to the plug breaker. It, yeah. Pl- yep. Yep. And tripping the breakers. No, this is, um, exactly the case and that's i think that's the fun thing for us to think about too what gets us excited about ranger ev and the platform is um even though we think about ev charging sometimes you just have to say the words that remember it's an opportunity to turn every home and small business into an energy seller um and we here in the pacific northwest we have because of all the hydroelectric our cost of electricity is actually quite low um but to highlight the problem, the charging anxiety problem, as we call it, from the host perspective or the business owner's perspective, you nailed it. That's exactly it. We're hearing the same stories. Um, certain campsites uh, and RV parks are not so happy with the EV travelers because they're plugging in, tripping breakers. And if, if they're coming through in any numbers, that's unrecouped right. energy costs. Yeah. Um, and as the vehicles get bigger, that's the other big reason we wanted to build this is make it easy for a small business to just get a ranger station QR code and put it on the entrance of the campsite and be like, Hey, EV people, uh, make sure you have this app so we can square up on your charging costs. And so tell me what you think. I mean, that's our big, our, our big thing is that um, energy has a value, particularly if it's powering all the travel adventures you want to do. And we as EV travelers, yes, we love getting free energy when we can, but ultimately- Any energy is better than no energy. Yeah. And ultimately we're sort of used to paying per kilowatt hour anyways. So if it's a reasonable price and it gives us convenience, um, yeah, that's the real thing we're excited about is, is to sort of, and that's been an interesting discussion in a lot of rural America too which is you can sort of flip the discussion and be like, well, hey, you can't really have a um, oil pump and a refinery on site uh, for you to sell gas to your guests. But if you put in the appropriate EV charger with our software solution, you can be charging up their vehicles overnight. And it's sort of an additional revenue stream. And the business owners we're talking to um, you know, I think Portland is something like it's in the top 10 for EV adoption in the nation. I'm sure so it's yeah. sort of like Portland, Seattle area. Um, those small businesses, you know, they rely on tourism and they're they're eager to attract, um, you know, city folk with the with the EVs. And they're happy to have them as guests uh, at their businesses. So uh, let's let's kind of walk through a thing. Let's say I'm on a road trip somewhere on the Oregon coast and I'm in desperate need of a charge and I come to a campsite or an Airbnb or wherever it may be that has a Ranger EV charger set up. How, how does that kind of experience work for me as the driver? For sure. So 
we're just getting started and where we're focusing on initially is working mainly with the small hospitality businesses and hosts. So the hope is um, you would encounter Ranger EV and uh, need to get our application in two ways. One would be the booking still all happens with the small business or vacation rental host. But if you were driving out somewhere, say in Central Oregon, and you found an Airbnb that you liked and you booked it, when you got the instructions, you would get a link that says, hey, we offer level two charging. You'll need a Ranger EV account. That would be one way that you would encounter us. The second would be you would just get there and you would see the QR code on the charger. Gotcha. And um, it would it would require for you to create a Ranger account and then add a payment method. And then going forward, as we grow this Ranger recreational network, um, you would be good to go and charge at any of those places. And the hope would be as we start to grow the network and all these fun, adventurous travel destinations, that the Ranger EV app also becomes a little bit more of a curated discovery portal, which okay. is has a feed of the ranger stations. And so you know that any hospitality or place to stay that's listed in our application um, has a level two charger. And you can, um, there would be a link for you to book it through our application as well. So that, no, that that's pretty interesting. So one of my concerns traditionally with apps is, especially when you're in the Oregon coast, sometimes network is spotty. Yep. How does that work? Or is this, it, it is still something where you kind of have to do in advance. I know like with some of the newer versions of iOS, you can kind of have a app light experience and still have a transaction happen without having to download an app. Is that something you guys are able to do or looking to do? So it's early days for us. Yeah. Um, but right now the connectivity issue is at wherever your travel destination is, yes, it requires um, the Wi-Fi connection at the Airbnb. And okay. so and and so when you're because that's what allows us to communicate with the level two charger. So we're just trying to make sure that there's good Wi-Fi access for that L2 charger. And if you're standing next to the L2 charger, then you should have the instructions on how to get the Wi-Fi and connectivity um, for the ranger station that's at that property. Of course. Going forward, um, there are plenty of technological solutions to the connectivity yeah. problem in remote areas, um, and there's lots of solutions to that. But in the beginning, we just sort of leverage the host or small business Wi-Fi network, and we try to work with them to make sure that that's a high fidelity signal. It's actually one well, that, thing we're interested in yeah. is um, you know now that Starlink is a thing. Um, yeah if there are businesses really out in remote locations or they have spotty Wi-Fi, uh, I don't know. What do you think? That's what we're actually, it's like an add on. If we get them to get a Starlink, uh, if you pulled up as a guest, would you, I don't know, would you pay an extra fee to have access to super broadband internet out in a remote location? You know, that's a pretty good question. Um, I don't know if you're a gamer here or you <laughs> want to stream, stream something. Uh, well, I, I just think like I do take, sometimes I will record these podcasts or uh, I have to take a Zoom Digital call. Digital nomad, yep. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or my wife has to uh, take video calls too. And so there's that. that is definitely an interesting business case. And I, I think that does make sense um, of the upcharge functionality. And, and uh, I mean, obviously traditional hotels do that all the time. And I've even seen that, I think, at a couple Airbnbs we've been to. So that makes sense. And I, I, I get the idea of like having, as long as you're at a rental or, or a business that has the Wi-Fi, that's easy. That's, I guess I was kind of thinking more, should we expect to see these if we go to like a state park or something more off the grid? But uh, no, I, I think there's such a need for that anyway, for um, having better, because I've seen some Airbnb say they have EV charging and it still is just a, a wall outlet that they yep. have in their garage. Yep. Um, I mean, we're hoping to have a solution there to yep. uh, re requires a little bit more trust and safety where if, um, for sure, if people are into, you know, there's a way to just list your plug um, and then just let the, 
let the guests know what the cost of electricity would be and give them the opportunity to pay um, as well. So there's solutions for that. Yeah, the connectivity issue, there's out in remote locations, you know, there's plenty of plenty of technologies to address that. Um, yeah. And some of that will come on newer generations of hardware. I mean, just the, the 5G networks and there are other sure. technologies that can support connectivity. Um, yeah, out in remote places. Now, uh, let's say as a, let's say I have a vacation rental, I don't, <laughs> but I wanted to sign up with you guys and kind of add this functionality to one of my rentals. How would I go about that? Or what, what does that process really look like? Yeah. So we're very much wanting to meet people where they're at. So, you know, in our experience, it tracks similar to EV adoption. You know, 90% of the vacation rental owners we talk to don't have an L2 charger yet. Yeah. So if, um, and we're finding the best case is um, that the owner of the property has an EV themselves and right. you know, they spend some time there, maybe one weekend a month. Uh, and so they're ready. They're interested in installing one anyways, because they want to be able to plug in their own vehicle when they use their own vacation rental. Yeah. So uh, any vacation rental hosts out there or property managers, um, for sure, just get in, con uh, get in touch with us. You can visit rangercharging.com uh, and contact us. And uh, a member of the team will get in touch with you. And we basically work with them to um, get a hardware solution, an L2 charger that works for them and works well with our platform, uh, find a local electrician, and then help them see if they qualify for any uh, incentives. Um, and yeah, that's been the process thus far. And if you're a um, vacation rental host who already has an L2 charger, um, you know, we would love to have you on the Ranger network as well. So again, you can reach us via the website, rangercharging.com. Uh, and um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And we could talk about how to onboard your level two charger and turn you into an energy seller. And hopefully uh, when we start doing some fun content and marketing, start sending more, um, you know, adventurous EV travelers to your, to your business too. And so currently you guys are all throughout North America or just the U S or is there kind of a, is for anyone that's listening to this, is there any kind of core areas that you guys are focused on currently? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're just getting I know we've started. Been talking about so, the Northwest. So I just wanted to, I yeah. Think so we're, we're, we're based here in Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're just starting to grow this and we sort of organize it by, um, which trips we can electrify. So the highest priority trip for me was that surf trip to the North coast. So we're, we're rolling out an initial vacation rental hosts on the North coast of Oregon. Um, and the trips and travels and places we know best, yes, are in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so right now we're in Oregon, but we're very very much looking regionally, um, Washington, Oregon, Idaho. Gotcha. And then um, over the coming years, for sure, as we work with partners, um, you know, achieving more national scale. No, that, that's great to hear. And I, I think there, I'm not exactly sure where to combine it, but there, there does seem to be some sort of overlap between definitely, I'm just trying to think like so many other They've they've never been EV focused though, so there was uh, or that are kind of like there's been a lot of campsite and camping apps and these kind of other things that obviously aren't quite the same, but there seems to be such like if you looked at the Venn diagram, a big overlap in the people a lot of areas kind of, for a collaboration yep. for sure, yeah, and I, and that's kind of what I've, I've been like just talking to you, kind of thinking about this, like um, obviously there could be collaboration on like with a national hotel chain, sure. But it, it does seem like probably it makes sense to start with these kind of smaller uh, kind of uh, localized chains and stuff to start as well. But then like, how do you scale that? And like having that kind of, as you talked about, like having a, an experience by going to like, you're going to Astoria this weekend. Here's mm -hmm. uh, the charger for the first night. And then when you're staying in Cannes Beach or wherever the second night, this is kind of what that almost kind of like a charging itinerary is set up for you to be. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean that's definitely definitely the the vision, and um, yeah, I mean we'd be eager to hear from people. Uh, people could comment on this podcast. Basically, in your EV travels, you know where are you staying away from home that you wish there was an L two charger, um, and we want to prioritize you know 
getting those chargers to where people are going because that's what's going to help drive this electrification and EV adoption is if people, I mean, that's, that's the way we do this. We sort of have to like build better products yeah. and the experience actually has to be better than the status quo. Um, so if we can save people time, money, and this audience knows it's more efficient. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done to make this uh, like a seamless, convenient process to travel in EVs. Well, one of the things that uh, kind of talking about Starlink, like the hardware to support this, uh, I, I actually have a Starlink at our place here. So that's what I'm using for this conversation today. But uh, I, I think it would make sense, obviously, to tie that with some of these, uh, especially along the coast, even the uh, uh, cable or uh, Internet, whether it be cellular <laughs> Or a lot of the broadband options too, they're pretty unstable, actually, at least in my experience, they seem to drop quite mm -hmm. a bit. So like doing it, it's it's an interesting idea to go to like someone who has a vacation rental, not only offer them a better internet package, but then obviously have this side of the uh, EV charging component to, to drive business and people who are exploring on the coast with their EV. But I'm curious, are there any hardware providers that your company works with like specifically, or is it... Kind of just about any level two charger or certain types of setups for what the level two charging experience is. And then is there even any car or OEM su uh, support that you guys are looking to expand to with certain electric vehicle models? Like, let's say they um, don't install level two charger, but they have like a 1450 uh, outlet or even a 120 volt outlet. Could you have the car then kind of tell how much is being charged? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd realized I'm kind of jumping all over the place with that, but it, no, it's just kind these of are, interesting. These are all the, all the things that we're getting into. So to take just the last point first, okay. yes, uh, any, any outlet, um, you know, we have a, we call it a virtual charger. So we, you become um, a ranger station, your location, and we send you a, a ranger station QR sticker and you put it over your NEMA 1450 or next to your 1450 uh, receptacle or uh, 110 outlet. And yes, there are lots of ways um, to then tender that energy transaction. Uh, to get started, the feature we're doing for this virtual charger feature in our application, it relies upon sort of um, uh, self-reporting by the guest, which basically gotcha. they... Uh, it, it's like Venmo. You basically yeah, yeah. look at your screen at the end of your charging session, and then you just thumb in how many kilowatt hours or just snap a, eventually just take a screenshot of your um, display in your car showing at the end of your charging session. Um, but the advantage is, is then when you scan the QR code, uh, we're here on the central east side. You may hear the train going by. Um, I was going to say on my side, you might hear a bunch of dogs start barking. So totally totally get that though the background oh, ambiance for the listeners this one's really going uh yes so there's ways to have the traveler um, basically use their vehicle and just enter in the amount of energy they've used um, there are other ways to communicate with the vehicle itself that requires some uh, partnerships with the uh, electric vehicle oem and we're certainly interested in those in the future um Regarding level two hardware uh, providers, you know, we have our favorites. Um, as we're starting, we like the ones that are OCPP compliant. Um, those, those work very well on our platform. Um, but we're also in the early stage here and we're, we're reaching out and we're talking with a lot of those L2 um, hardware OEMs about how we, how we grow this Ranger network and what are some of the best hardware solutions to use. No, that's great. I, I mean, kind of looking forward, are there opportunities that maybe you want to share or kind of like looking at the roadmap of kind of what product uh, next steps might be or even potential uh, partnerships that you're kind of looking to do to kind of improve that experience for people using the Ranger EV app and like kind of make it this kind of more uh, larger platform of different technologies working together? Yeah, for sure. Um, again, along those lines, um, if you if you don't have a, a level two charger for your home driveway or your vacation rental yet, when you're selecting a Wi-Fi connected L2 charger, 
Um, pick one that's OCPP compliant because yeah. that's going to give you lots of good options about which software you use to um, control it. And that works super well with our platform. Um, and I think that's a great call out just with some of the stuff we've even been seeing in the level two space yeah, lately. Yeah. And unfortunately, <laughs> good and bad. <laughs> Yeah, juice box owners. Um, yeah. Where lots of people are working on solutions for you, um, we're happy to be here as a resource uh, and and try to come up with a, a solution so that you can yeah have functioning chargers um, and software that drives it. Feel free to reach out to us. But yeah, hopefully we can come back in the future and when we've got some of these um, partnerships lined up, we could we could uh, tell you tell you a bit more about it. At this early stage, you know, we're a new software company and, you know, software is just like living, breathing thing and it needs people to use it so we can yeah. figure out all the bugs and things that need to get fixed. So we have an early beta version of our um, Ranger product, Ranger EV product, which is a web application. Um, yeah, we're looking for users. Um, so if you're interested, if you have an EV, um, yeah, check out rangercharging.com. Um Check out our web application. Reach out to us. Um, you can find our links on our website. Um, we would love to hear from you so we can make sure that we're um, building software that you want to use when you're when you're out traveling. No, I, I think that that's great. And I definitely will have links to that and more in our today's show notes. I guess as someone who has Rivian and obviously like kind of doing the adventuring thing, I guess I'm curious, are there any recent kind of EV trips you've taken recently that really kind of surprised you or that you loved? And then if there are any other in the Northwest that you're kind of hoping to do soon, I'd just love to hear more about that. Yeah. I mean, some of my favorite trips. So um, obviously I think the Oregon coast is a magical place. Uh, all, all different seasons. Now it's fall. So the, um, the Northwest swells and yeah. sort of the serious surf is, is starting to arrive. Um, you get the, you know, it's also, you know, beach campfire season and great misto uh, winter experience on the Oregon coast. Um, in the spring and fall, if people have never been, um, my family originally is from Idaho. And if you've never, right after you go through Boise, if you take uh, highway 20 up near sun Valley, uh, if you've mm. never been past like craters of the moon, um, it's just, uh, it's more of a continuation of like the high desert sort of yeah. like Eastern Oregon. Um, but that craters of the moon area and up in sun Valley in Idaho, um, those are probably more, some of the, my favorite EV trips I've taken so far. And that that's what drove this product is some of those places are, there's nothing out there. It's right. nothing but an RV park. Uh, but yeah, if <laughs> yeah. you can, if I would, Idaho is a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful place. Um, and it's, we want to make it easier to go there in EVs as well. So that, that's a trip I would recommend craters of the moon up in the Idaho desert. Yeah, that's a gorgeous area. And I, I definitely agree that, um, I've wanted to spend more time there and then, uh, God, what was that? Was that two summers ago? I'd kind of done a trip through Northern Idaho through, uh, Coeur d'Alene and others. Oh, beautiful. And just yep. such a great place and so much fun to, just go, uh, even without any purpose. It's just beautiful up there all times of the year, but getting out of the lake in the summer was just great and such a fun kind of road trip to do. And I think honestly, for a lot of people, if you live in the Northwest and if you're skeptical or concerned about doing it, like going out to Coeur d'Alene is about as easy in a lot of ways of doing an EV road trip as there is, uh, just because there's so much charging options along the way, uh, fast charger options mm -hmm. along the way to really make that as uh, easy as possible and stress-free for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, let's see here. Other favorite EV trips. Um, I mean, it's been a year ago, but um, I went along with another cool um, Portland climate tech company called Aris Hydronics, which is making very innovative uh, heat pumps combined. Oh, cool. Um, HVAC and hot water systems. Um, we towed their Aris Hydronics um, demo unit from Portland all the way down to Silicon Valley, San Jose with the Rivian. And that was a 5,000 oh, wow. pound trailer. So that was, that's a trip. It's easily doable, but um, you know, you're going to knock, knock the EV range in about half with that heavy of a trailer. Yeah. And we definitely had some, I think it was near Roseburg, Oregon, 
you know, mm-hmm. we didn't think we were going to make it over the hill to the DC fast chargers. Um, we thought we were going to brick it, but we just made it. Um, so that can be an exciting, an exciting. Yeah, EV Southern trip. Oregon and Northern California is gorgeous. Uh, and it's definitely improved with how many chargers are along that area, but there's just a lot of kind of unexpected, I guess I shouldn't say unexpected, but if you haven't been there before, there is a lot of elevation change, yep. a lot of twisty roads and, um, sometimes high winds too. So pretty much everything that can really throw off your range estimates, it'll kind of throw at you through that area, especially in the winter time too, then you're dealing with all sorts of storms, but it's, it's a gorgeous and such a fun area to drive through. But that, that's great to hear. And I definitely, I think a uh, great company we'd probably want to have on this podcast as well to learn about that. Is that um, something, are you looking to kind of document more of these road trips that you do in the future and kind of short term as almost, is that how you're currently kind of beta testing where Ranger EV locations and where to put these Ranger stations at? Or what have you, fa- yeah, is there kind of like- For any, sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it seems like the feedback. most fun way to do it. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, that was- we went through sort of a research and customer discovery phase as they call it. Uh, but a lot of it is just hearing from the EV enthusiasts and yeah, the types of trips people take. Uh, and we encourage people to, um, we just set up a new Instagram account, which is at Ranger charging. Um, if you're on Instagram, please, um, send a message there. If you, again, if you ever end up anywhere that you wish there was a level two charger, we love to know where people would love chargers. But yeah, that's definitely the idea. Uh, We're hoping in the future, we have some fun things in the work, in the works where hopefully we'll be able to um, tell some of these electric adventure road trip stories through some compelling content in the future. Um, And if there are people who are videographers or, you know, interested in telling those types of stories or going to those adventurous locations, um, yeah, we're interested in working with them as well. No, that... That, I mean, is kind of just, I think the ideal sort of thing just along the West Coast in general with so many of these great, beautiful places that we get to enjoy all the time and really have made EV road tripping so much fun. And so I I think that's such a great thing to be doing and seeing. And I got a feeling you guys will be very successful just because a lot of people do want to kind of see those stories and learn more and uh, test them out for themselves. I mean, that's sometimes how you have to do it as I... I myself even just kind of took my first, uh, when I first got the, our Model Y, uh, you're always kind of unsure as to what the range and how it's actually going to perform when you kind of run into real weather. And so I ended up doing a road trip from uh, Bend, Oregon down to kind of south of Mount Shasta and Mm -hmm. then across to Alturas, California, and then up through Silver Lake and all these kind of, it's actually a very beautiful, but kind of talking about extremely remote areas that, um, the best thing you might find along the way is a 120 volt outlet. Just some of that will let you plug into an outlet if you can even find a place along the way because it's it's so beautiful and how remote it is. But mm-hmm. when it's kind of your first time doing that in a car uh, or specifically an electric vehicle, even it it can be a fun challenge. A lot of charging anxiety for sure. Yeah, but I, I and I think it's still wild to see in the two years I've had my car how much that's changed, especially in Central Oregon, um, with both more. DC fast chargers and, but there's still a decent amount of level two charging, but, uh, I, I would like to see more of that improve. I mean, to me, it seems like there's a pretty big early opportunity for you guys with like KOA and those campgrounds and stuff like that. So I've got to imagine that's probably pretty high on the business development, uh, scale for you guys to kind of make those partnerships and try and get in with them. Yeah. And also, um, you know, the technology we're building, Remember, uh, Portland is a good example. Your home driveway. Uh, For most sure. people still still don't, you know. So on the east side of Portland, uh, most people don't use their garages or hobby houses. You know, they park the cars in the driveway. And yeah. sort of that neighborhood plug share case. Um, that's our technology works great for that too. So if you're the one in your neighborhood who has an EV and your neighbors get one but maybe don't have a charger and you want to you know, charge them a little bit to yeah. plug in overnight or use yours. Um, we can, we can do that too. But it seems like a good opportunity too, if you have kind of like a level two charger, whether it's even in your driveway, but, uh, if you wanted to put one like street side in front of your house and even be able to offer kind of for people who park 
nearby or just don't have the opportunity uh, natively that you could at least make some extra money doing it that way and kind of make EV charging a little bit easier for your neighbors. Yeah, we're we're interested in talking with the city of Portland more. There's that um, curbside charging, uh, yeah. you know, is a big issue. And people who don't own a home or don't have off street parking, um, what's, you know, what are the barriers to them charging their car? And that's one of the things that leads to lines at the DC fast chargers in a right. city, right? Is people who don't have access to home charging. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, I don't know if there's much you can share for that's pretty early. In your experience working with the city of Portland on curbside charging, has there been anything that you've kind of that stood out to you or is that still pretty early? The reason I ask is I was looking to try and figure out in the city of Ben, I just haven't had a chance to actually dedicate time to it. We, uh, we are eager to talk with the yeah. city of, uh, Portland. Uh, that sounds about and right. so, <laughs> yeah. And I have a feeling there are plenty of other, um, there are other players in the space too, um, who are looking at this problem around street parking, uh, as well. Um, when, and I know. Oh, I'm sorry. What were we going to say? Oh, I was going to say, I think there's a, a couple companies, um, you know, one around New York too, that's very focused on that sort of sidewalk, you know, rolling out level two charging on, on the streets too. So there's, there's definitely, everyone sees the problem uh, yeah. and, and everyone's trying to build solutions. Well, I, I think that's what's kind of interesting about the opportunity that your team's providing just because it does keep it fairly simple. <laughs> And cost effective because there are some really cool curbside things that are, have so far been kind of pilot sponsored by a lot of cities, uh, but sometimes they're either more expensive or fairly complicated. Like some of these ones that have the whole, understandably, but the whole retracting uh, yeah. cable and all this stuff. So uh, no, I, I think it's the more options, the better. Right now, I think that's great, and just trying to make it easier for people to get an EV and charge it wherever they are uh, is such a great thing to have more of for but, sure uh, yeah no i i realize we're kind of coming up on the end of our time here brian i want to say thank you so much for coming on today we'll have to have you on again soon i definitely want to pro- see how this uh progresses here in the northwest i hope to be going on a couple of these adventures soon and using your guys chargers because i i think this is definitely something that has a lot of potential and definitely has a big need for so brian thank yeah, you so let's... much for coming on today and i guess for anyone who's curious what's the best way to connect with your team and kind of engage with you if they want to reach out and learn more uh for sure visit rangercharging.com and there's a contact us form uh or for, feel free to dm us on instagram at ranger charging and uh, Chase, yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, love to talk all things electrification, and we should for sure uh, make you into a ranger. And uh, I, I think we'll get, that's you, we'll get you up later. We'll yeah. we'll get you out to some ranger stations, and we should for <laughs> sure go on some adventures together. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Brian. We'll have to talk soon. That wraps up another episode of Grid Connections. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Brian Clark, CEO and co-founder of Ranger EV. And we hope you learned something new about the future of EV charging and how it's shaping outdoor adventures. From peer-to-peer energy transactions to making EV road trips more seamless, there's so much innovation happening in the EV space and we're thrilled to bring you stories like this one. If you found this episode insightful, please share it with a friend or a fellow EV enthusiast who might enjoy it as well. And don't forget to leave us a positive review on our podcast page. It helps us continue bringing you great conversations to your feed. Thanks for tuning in. And until next week, this is the Grid Connections Podcast signing off.